a glorious day to be in a, uh, in a windowless room, but I hope it will be a way of making some pictures in the imagination to think together about the emotions. But before I start, I want to um, express my profound thanks to Dr. Heal for his beautiful introduction to the Maxwell Institute for hosting me, and really to uh, Dr. Taylor, who has been, uh, we met at a conference, and um, the synergy between her work on um, early Christian art and, and lay people's experience, I was so excited to hear about it because that is what I've been turning my attention to. I'm trying to understand in a period known for religious rock stars, like these intense ascetics, you know, hermits who lived out in caves and, and people who fasted for, for months at a time. I'm trying to understand what it felt like to just be an ordinary Christian. And that's what my talk is about today. So um, I'm going to, uh, not without emotion, we had a little uh, technical uh, moment. I'm not up, I'm, okay. <laughs> it should, there it is, all right. Okay, I, you're going to have to bear with the, the just the, the clock at the top. Maybe that'll help you remind me. If you see me going on too long, just, just, just okay. All right. So how did it feel to be Christian in late antiquity? The letters of the traveling missionary Paul or the prison diary of a North African martyr named Perpetua offer rare glimpses into the fears, joys, and even rage of some early Christians. Even so, the emotional landscapes of ordinary Christians are hard to access. To understand their fears, pity, joys, anger, and even disgust, we need to seek out those who, to, who sought to stir and shape emotions. Thus, I've focused in recent years on what sermons and songs can reveal about the emotions of those who first heard them. The first centuries of the Christian movement were marked by intense interest in ways of knowing, for some beyond the material world, but for many through materiality itself, the stuff of, of life, in other words. Through gospel stories and letters, Jesus' followers watched for any signs of a new divine order breaking in. Ordinary things, whether mustard seeds, fig trees, or even temple curtains, all had the power to reveal the inbreaking kingdom. And the imagination unfolded new realities. For instance, the martyr Perpetua described in her prison diary how the, on the eve of her execution, her prison cell had become a palace. Or the blazing body The blazing body of a martyr called Polycarp was described thus. For the fire made the likeness of a room like the sail of a vessel filled with wind and surrounded the body of the martyr as with a wall. And he was within it not as burning flesh, but as bread that is being baked, or as gold and silver being refined in a furnace. And we perceived such a fragrant smell as the scent of incense or other costly spices. I've highlighted some words just to give you a sense of how, in this gruesome moment, you're being given images of spaces and of fragrances. And, and just there's so much stuffed stuff packed in a moment that should, by some martyr accounts, have been an otherworldly moment that the body doesn't matter, that stuff doesn't matter. But this description is saying the stuff does matter. It gets you through these moments. That tormenting fire should build safe, protecting spaces, a room, a billowing ship sail, a protective wall, is really striking for me. Moreover, the consuming fire emits not the stench of burning flesh, but the sweet odors of baking, baking bread. Call it magical thinking or call it the imagination. As this example suggests, much as early Christians had good reason to distrust the evidence of their senses in a hostile world, they were capable of relying on their senses as gateways to a deeper understanding of divine realities beyond grim appearances. Christians' reliance on sensory cues for knowing sacred realities became more prominent in the centuries that followed the legalization of Christianity in the early fourth century. No longer facing the threat of persecution and now discovering a greater stake in this material world, early Christians developed religious practices that relied on their physical senses 
to perceive divine mysteries. They cultivated a set of interior senses now linked to physical perceptions. In Christian initiation, for example, perfumed oil was applied to specific parts of the body, first to the forehead, then the eyes, the nostrils, the mouth, the ears, breast, hands, and feet, while a corresponding scriptural passage was recited with each touch, as if to awaken each corresponding <laughs> spiritual sense. In addition to this rite called chrismation, other rituals awaken the sensory imagination. Pilgrimage to local and distant holy places, the Eucharist, that ritual ingestion of consecrated bread and wine, liturgical processions to a series of holy places, and the veneration of body, bodily relics of the saints, all these religious practices engaged several modes of sensory knowing. Christians learned to regard the material world as rife with self-significance, and they staged encounters with the sacred past to pursue that. These material practices gave fuller expression to the doctrine of the incarnation, the belief that God became flesh in the person of Christ and thereby invested the material world with divine presence. So how do emotions fit into this? The re-education of perceptions I've been talking about took many forms. New Christians were taught not only what to see, but how to see their own rituals and how to feel about that. When new converts admitted that the consecrated bread and wine, a rite that had been concealed from them prior to baptism, I mean, they couldn't even see it being performed, until they were baptized, it turned out to be rather underwhelming. Preachers advised them to look differently upon the elements of the rite. One way to counteract the ordinariness of the bread at communion, they suggested, was to summon the spiritual senses to imagine the splendor they anticipated. Cupped hands, for instance, might conjure a divine throne. The altar, a sepulcher for Christ's body. Outside the church spaces, devout householders were taught to try sensory re-education. In the dark of night, one preacher adv advised, awake and watch your family members as they sleep so that you can get a glimpse of the dead who await the resurrection at the end of days. I mean, have you ever thought of that? If you're up in the middle of the night going and spying on your sleeping family members and picturing the end of days, this is what the preacher, you know, they're constantly teaching people to rethink what they're seeing to reimagine a future in their present. That's that intersection I'm talking about. So not just vision, but other senses, if properly trained, could become gateways to perceiving God in the world, not beyond the world, not strictly beyond the world. Sermons, legends of the apostles and saints' lives suggest a variety of ways of re-educating sensation. The senses, however, were not the only way Christians learned through their bodies to experience the world differently. Remaking the emotions also figured into the formation of Christian identity. Before we proceed to talk about uh, these particular emotions, let me just talk about the word emotions in itself. Um, if we were in a smaller setting, I might ask what it evokes for you. Uh, but in this setting, let's think about it. Just take a moment if you're jotting things down. What are some emotions that come to mind when you think? What, are, what do you think of as emotions? Impulses, okay. Other words, one word. I love this. Hmm? Sadness. Sadness, good. Fear. Fear, good. Any others? Impulse? Hmm? Reaction. Reaction, great. Okay, so all there, we've got it already. Two ways of thinking. We've got particular emotions, things we, certain mental states we might call emotions. I heard sadness, I heard fear. But we also have a sense, we have an attitude towards emotions, that emotions themselves are something that we don't always have full control over, impulses, things that maybe are not as cognitive or mental as we think. They just, they burst out, right? This hydraulic sense that maybe we're all keeping emotions in and then now and then they just burst forward. There, so there's a long history of the emotions. That, that idea of emotion is impulse, um, as something non-cognitive. His, was really probed already in the, in the 19th century. The American philosopher William James wrote an essay called What is an Emotion? to try to move emotions away from this language of, of just um, animal reaction, you know, non, it's something subhuman. Well, what I'm doing for the early Christians, I think, is if we have to remember we are not 
uh, as in the early Christians were not influenced by the philosopher Descartes, who had a very tidy distinction between mind and body, mind over body, mind over matter. We've inherited a lot of that dualism. So it, as I use, I'm, gonna, I'm thinking about emotions as things that intersect. So yes, there's an impulsive side to emotions, but in that impulse, I think um, philosophers like Martha Nussbaum, who have really thought hard about, even in that impulse, we are making some kind of judgment. So I may lash out, at, I don't like to do it, but if I have to lash out at someone, I find it could be that something I valued has been really uh, violated or has been trampled upon. So this idea is that even in our impulses, there's some kind of cognition going on. And that's what I want to think about, the cognitive side of emotions. So emotions such as joy or love, envy, pity, anger, they're cognitive and precognitive. They consist of mental activity, yet they also trigger, trigger physical symptoms. My racing heart, goosebumps, tensed muscles, and flushed cheeks could signal that I'm feeling fear or that I'm nervous being in front of a big crowd or whatever, that I'm in love maybe. You know, you never know. Yet the emotion involved also comprises some forms of cognition. I may sense something harms my well-being that somehow threatens that which I hold dear, my family, my community, my country. Um, unlike some psychological or philosophical schools which regarded the emotions as non-rational, I approach emotions as consisting of judgments that are tied Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just gonna. There we go. Um, okay. I'm a, I'm a set of uh, uh, ivories here with some uh, some emotional content. I'll I'll return to. Um, uh, emotions are. I approach emotions as consisting of judgment and are tied up in rationality. In addition to being cognitive and physiological, emotions also reflect one's historical and cultural context. So if you think of it like uh, in, the, in the epic of Homer, the Iliad, for example, a woman's shame might be bound up in the fate of her warrior husband. You might think of Andromache's poignant speech to the Trojan hero, Hec Trojan hero, hero Hector, who's about to certainly die um, and leave her widowed. Yes, my, yet my own sense of shame may arise from a keen awareness of undeserved privilege more than any kind of undeserved slight. Uh, so these are very cultural activities, emotions. In short, our language for emotions is always provisional, sharing some physiological traits, but also upon closer examination, revealing deep cultural and historical attitudes and traces. So at the very least, we can say emotions intersect both our inner life and our social life. They suffuse our being and our actions, our interactions, our perceptions. And little wonder, then, that we have so many words to convey those internal and external dimensions, their private and public manifestations. In English, think about it, we, we have words like feeling, passion, fervor, affect, sensibility, sentiment, appetite, changes of temper. These are just a few of examples of the words that have been bandied about. Some historians and psychologists distinguish between feelings and emotions as a way to maybe differentiate the interior cognitive states from bodily responses. Um, or for maybe um, emotions really entered our vocabulary not before the 18th century. So some people find emotions as a word is just anachronistic. It comes from this idea of movement, that something is moving out from, from within you. Um, but I'm going to put aside those, those conversations for now uh, because I just want to recall that I want to keep the somatic, the bodily, and the, and the cognitive together. That's what I think is going on in, this, in the early Christian world. So I follow um, a historian called Monique Scher, who points out that too many semantic distinctions risks bifurcating emotions, as these are bodily states and these are cognitive states. So I, like her, I'm going to use emotion and feeling um, interchangeably. As she claims, is an emotion is something we do and not just something we have. They are infused with intel intelligence and judgment, in the words of Nussbaum. So one feels grief about someone or something. 
One feels joy towards some, someone or something, and so on. Emotions then are bound up in some perception of value. An affront or violation may rouse anger, um, affection, compassion, but still it is always the emotion is directed at someone. We learn, from, we learn these emotions and their attendant values through bodily practice, or what sociologist Pierre Bourdieu called habitus. I approach emotional experiences then as learned behaviors reinforced through bodily repetition. Learned behaviors is key here. Like sense perception, emotions are also shaped by cultural, political, and social environments. Thus, it is appropriate to speak of emotional re-education. And so I want to turn to the second part of my, my title. Um, this re-education suggests two aspects of early Christian identity. They're particularly salient. First, we are in a culture that was steeped in rhetorical education, by which young men, and some young women actually, learned, were taught how to give great speeches, how to stir emotions in others, how to persuade others through speeches, and when necessary, how to change oneself. Although, although those pedagogical methods appear in textbooks written for elites, few today would doubt that the tropes, techniques, and devices of rhetorical education shape the wider culture. So, the term re-education implies that preachers and their audiences participated in shared rhetorical culture, deploying familiar strategies of persuasion. Now, the term re-education might also conjure some repressive and coercive associations. Some of you might be thinking of the re-education re camps in the Chinese Cultural Revolution, for instance. Yet I'm thinking of re-education as more persuasive and non-coercive. Efforts to adopt new identities and appropriate habits, behaviors, or beliefs. This re-education might call into question conventions and norms that, previous thought, that were previously thought to be the bedrock of one's existence. And the term is apt for early Christianity, a religious movement bound up as, in paradox. As Dame Averill Cameron, the historian, has noted, Christian beliefs were rooted in, in paradox. As the Apostle Paul reminded his congregation in Corinth, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. Um, God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. So, and there were also beliefs that are, are characteristic of these paradoxes, the belief that the divine became flesh, that death brings life, that the end marks the beginning, that a Messiah can suffer. Are, all these are examples that are shot through with paradox. But such paradoxes were not confined to disembodied thoughts or beliefs. They were lived out through Christian bodies. Consider ascetic Christians who stood atop a pillar in constant vigil and prayer. These are the rock stars I, was, I began with. Or the predilection for miracle stories of healing and exorcism. These ideas are not prior to practice, but, are made, but made those ideas palpable in daily life. Paradox comes alive through practice. So in the time that remains, I explore the re-education of emotion in two settings. First, I'm going to describe how one fourth century preacher set the emotional tone for a group of newly baptized adults. Followed, um, actually, adults preparing for baptism, excuse me. Followed by the songs of the sixth century by Romanos, and one in particular on Noah, which I think has a great example of group feelings. So I'm going to look at individual feelings, reshaping individual feelings, then turn to group feelings. Um, and so, so I, I always love this phrase. And John Chrysostom, in around 388, gave a series of baptismal instructions. Um, his word means, for the Greek speakers, golden mouth. He was a prolific preacher. And he gave a series of, of these baptismal instructions. And his motto, one, the line I think is, that really captures is, let our life be strange and different. That was his advice. Let our life be strange and different. That idea of just seeing your existence with whole new eyes. That's what he really wanted to impart. And I think the emotions play a role in that. Um, elsewhere, I've talked about how he reworks the senses. I'm going to focus more on the emotions. The ritual re-education of the emotions appears not surprisingly in instructions to adults preparing for Christian initiation. John Chrysostom delivered a particularly interesting series of catechetical instructions in Antioch around 388. Two surviving homilies were delivered during Lent, 
a time of preparation for baptism at Easter. This sequence highlights the appropriate emotional registers involved. involved. Remember, in the fourth century, Christianity has only been legalized maybe one or two generations. And so you still have a lot of adults seeking conversion now. So it's not, we don't yet, this is not yet the age of infant baptism, as some Christian sects would have eventually. We're still really in a very adult phenomenon. The first sermon in the series, delivered some 30 days before Easter, sets the emotional tone. Quote, this is a time for joy and glass, gladness of the spirit, he says. He likens the mood to the joy one feels at a wedding, or, as he puts it, a military enlistment. There is joy in heaven and on earth, he says. The spiritual marriage has a handsome, this is a great sermon, because the there's this handsome, wealthy groom, uh, which is Christ, and the congregation is described as the bride, but she's described as a rather ugly bride uh, with a rather sordid past. So, so there's this idea of joy, but there's something always a little mixed in his view of emotions. I wanted to put a slide up of um, poor Fiona, you know, from Shrek. I just thought, <laughs> and her wedding dress, I thought that would be great, but um, I just want to find my slides again. There we go. Uh, so I spared you Fiona, because I think actually Fiona was quite lovely in her own way, so I didn't want to cast her as an ugly bride, but anyway. Uh, so um, her ugliness, though, I want to focus on that, because the bride's ugliness um, and her sordid past is such a way to describe the congregation before him. Her ugliness, somewhat ironically, serves as a reminder of what you need to forget. Um, and so forget the past, forget your family, forget past shame and anger, dr grudges, jealousies, um, past actions. By forgetting all these passions, the way is cleared for instilling or acquiring charity and joy. So there's kind of a lot of mental housekeeping. You have to move some things out in order to clear the way for the right emotions. True joy, he says, requires the recognition of illusory joys. The preacher exhorts all to avoid the theater, for instance, notably the cruel pleasure of watching a fellow human being mangled by savage beasts. So the theater, he's not thinking here of Euripides, but really um, of kind of gladiatorial combat. Um, he says, uh, are you not afraid? Do you, do you not shudder for fear that a thunderbolt might fall from on high and set your head ablaze? You, by your shouts, have a personal part in the murder, if not by your hand, at least by your tongue. He shames his audience into recognizing how their own emotional energy as spectators is complicit in that brutality. He calls, he calls out um, that there is nothing passive about spectatorship. It has intense emotional engagement. He closes by urging the congregation to spend their days, as he puts it in quote, prayers and confessions in reading and compunction. The activities that permit re emotional reattunement. In calling attention to their complicity, their complicity in negative and fierce emotions, Chrysostom sets before them the slow and deliberate work of shifting emotional registers. This is not a matter of just turning off, off the anger and the hate and flipping on the joy. It's about having set the tone with joy, the preacher mounts the forces to push away past hard emotions. As ancient textbooks on the arts of memory already reminded them, forgetting is not simply a matter of hitting delete. And even those of us who hit delete today somehow know that somewhere out there in cyberspace, in social media, our past is always going to be there. Uh, it reminds us too painfully that nothing is ever permanently erased. And that was certainly the case for the ancient memory. One can try to bury it by overlaying it with stronger, more lasting memories, or in this case, emotions. Likewise, the preacher contends with the counterforces of emotions. Re-education is less about deleting than about overlaying more lasting dispositions and clearing the emotional space for them. The next sermon, um, 10 days later by Chrysostom, finds the catechumens closer to the impending rite of actual baptism. In, few, in, the, in a few days, they would stand outside the baptistry, and once inside, they would be stripped, anointed from head to toe with olive oil, before facing west and rejecting Satan, the lord of darkness, directly. As, and there, uh, we have all these quotes, I, I renounce you Satan, I renounce you Satan and your pomp. I, there are all these formula that you're supposed to utter as if speaking to Satan. 
Following the renunciation of Satan, or apotaxis, this idea of disconnecting, um, the candidate turned and faced east to pledge her adhesion, or soon taxis, to Christ with the words, I enter into your service, O Christ. Following exorcisms, the power of God was called down upon the water, sometimes in the form of a thanksgiving prayer, and then came the immersion of the candidate three times. The candidate was dressed in a white garment and partook of the communion, the ritual ingestion of consecrated bread and wine. Chrysostom sets the stage by evoking the sensory richness of the rite. He contrasts the expectant um, initiant to Adam's tasting the forbidden fruit in paradise, the first couple's proximity to Eden after the inspulsion. The interesting John Chrysostom always emphasized that Adam and Eve, after they'd been kicked out of paradise, were kept just outside paradise, so they could see daily what they'd lost. This idea of East of Eden was like they were right outside the doors. Um, that man might see each hour, as he said, the joys of which he had deprived himself by his failure to obey. The need for the eyes of the spirit to discern the full spiritual significance of the baptismal rites, the sounds of the exorcist words, and the postures and gestures involved, these are all described by Chrysostom. The sensory cues prime the audience to imagine the emotional drama that is un to unfold at the renunciation. The exorcism, John Chrysostom notes, in frankly material terms, quote, impresses great piety on the soul and leads it to abundant compunction. That this right levels all distinctions of status might leave the well-to-do feeling disgusted. But such an emotion, he assures, his, he assures his audience, is entirely absent from these proceedings because all these differences find no place in the world of spirit. He admits his own tears and bitter groans as he underwent initiation and the shame he feels in not having lived up to the new course of life he ushered in. So we see here Chrysostom is kind of telling them what emotions they might expect. You might feel like, oh, if you're just treated the same as that slave next to you, uh, you might feel disgust in any other setting. As Remember, Roman society, even every, every arena, every theater, always had different seating arrangements depending on your status in society. And here you brought with someone else. So this idea, you won't feel disgust because the rights have un unlocked. You won't be capable of feeling disgust. But here's the way to feel joy. Um, the preacher describes also not just the baptized and, and emotions, but Satan's as well. He describes in vivid detail how, how the devil will react to these rites. The enemy, he says, is, quote, furious, grinds his teeth, and goes about like a roaring lion, which witnesses rejoice, and rejoicing, which witnesses rejoice upon seeing the newly baptized emerge from waters. The emotional unhinging of the devil is a recurrent motif in these sermons. The enemy is afraid of the brightness of the garment worn by the newly baptized. Um, Satan feels shame upon seeing the spiritual panoply of the newly baptized. Full of shame, quote, he, er, he hurries to retire. Eventually, by the 6th century, um, elsewhere I've written about how Satan starts getting to speak his peace and, and his anger. And so in, in later sermons, you have actually people making up speeches, what Satan would say when he saw you newly baptized. Um, we can discuss those more at Q&A, but for now I'm going to focus on the 4th century. Finally, there's another emotional scenario laid out in these sermons as the preacher warns against postponing baptism, the life-altering significance of, bab um, uh, of baptism, because it really changed your entire life, you had to change your ways, many people deferred baptism until their deathbed. And so he describes another kind of emotional scene. Think of the joy you're having today by being with us. And those who postpone the baptism are only surrounded by lament, by grief, by your family members weeping profusely. You find yourself, as he put it, in a thick cloud of despondency. So what I've, what I've been describing are the, the power of the preacher to create these emotional word pictures, the vividness of Satan's fury, the, the, the sheer uh, the distraught family members at your own deathbed as you're experiencing emotion and so on. As these examples from Chrysostom's baptismal instructions demonstrate, baptism unleashed a host of emotional upheavals, the pushing away of anger and envy to make space for joy, imagining fury of the defeated enemy, and the case of deathbed baptism, the lament and grief of the soon to be bereaved. We also detect in such sermons the tools of re-education, forgetting as a f by overlaying, 
undoing deep-seated impressions by inserting new ones, finding an emotional re register that's new enough to diminish the old habits of bad emotions, such as disgust. Re-education of the emotion requires us to imagine a setting where um, the preacher used word pictures to set the scene and relied on vividness. These are all techniques coming out of the rhetorical handbooks. Having considered the impact of forgetting on the re-education of emotions to counteract the palpable fury of the devil, it is worth noting that so far the emotional effort is really on the individual level. In individual level. In the final part of my paper, I consider how groups were mobilized to feel during Lent. And I'm going to turn now to vigils. Liturgical song could be the engine of that emotional movement. All right, here we go. Um, to il illustrate this emotional naviga navigation, I now turn to a metrical hymn um, by a metrical hymn on Noah. Let me say just a few words of metrical hymns. These are retellings of biblical stories that um, are told from different characters' perspectives. So tomorrow I'm going to be talking about one where um, the, the days after Jesus' death are described by Hades as a person, telling the story of what it felt like for Jesus to come down to the underworld. Here, one of the, to give you a vivid sense of what's going on, these, things were, these vigils were held at night, Congregations gathered, and the preacher might sing each stanza. But in the red, you, I've described the refrain. So the congregation joined in the refrain. So if you really, they're, they're poetry because they're metrical. They were sung, the sermons were sung. And so they're hymns, so I'm sometimes calling them hymn. In Greek, they're known as kantakia, which is from the word for the rods that held liturgical scrolls. But watch, you know, just the emotional register in we have one brief description of what it felt like to sing these. It is wonderful to sing psalms and hymns to God and to scourge the demons with reproaches. They are our eternal enemies. By scourging them, we mean the ridicule enacted every time we rehearse the drama of their fall. True pain grips, grips Satan whenever our church reproduce with fearful pity the triumph of the demons. Satan cannot touch a human unless God permits it. And the whole congregation joins in. He is the master of the universe. It, it, this this fr refrain can also shift characters. It can take on different emotional registers. But I just want to give you a sense of what the, that the congregation is involved in this singing. So to turn to Noah, uh, Drowning Out the Damned. In the Noah hymn, uh, Romanos recasts the story of the flood and its aftermath according to a series of crowds. Noah is actually doesn't sing much in this story. It's really about the people around him. Romanos uh, describes the con you know as the congregation who hears the tale, the recalcitrant people who ignore Noah's warnings. Even the animals are singing in this story, and incorporeal celestial beings and Noah's family. So there's a whole series of crowds in this hymn I'm going to talk about. The structure of this kontakion is very tightly organized, and, but the refrain is Rusai Pantas Redimasol. This is what the congregation would sing at the end of every one stanza. There are at least two dozen stanzas in most of these hymns, so as a congregant, you would really be involved in this. In the, and remember, this is going on in the dark of night, candlelit um, late into the night during Lent, too. So think about, you know, there's some empty bellies in the room, too, um, a season of fasting. Um, the phrase can be supplicatory, this phrase, redeem us all, can be supplicatory when spoken by Noah or his family, and yet have an ironic tone when uttered on behalf of animals or the drowned. The soloist exhorts the congregation to enter the drama, yet avoid the fate of the drowned when the time of final judgment comes. Yet the sinful people remain silent in their unrepentance. Noah implores them to weep bitterly and cry out to God, redeem us all. But his words fall on deaf ears and prompt no response. God, however, hears Noah's prayer and assembles a crowd of beasts. Though wild and savage, they are capable of fearing the wrath of God. Thus this menagerie both mimics and at the same time shames the people's unresponsiveness. Although speechless, the animals project a vision of the final days as wolves and sheep stand side by side, serpents mixed with birds, yet even this silent chorus does not move the, those endowed with speech to utter their repentance or cry, redeem us all. 
Giving up on the unrepentant, Noah and his family board the boat along with all the animals. And upon God's sealing of the vessel, Noah's voice alone utters the refrain, redeem us all, having given up on those who refuse to hear him. The refrain persists through the storm, through the 40 days. It punctuates the, de the description of the deluge, how the waves overtook the unrepentant who did not cry out, redeem us all. Not only do animals serve as an alternative crowd, um, this is not an alternative fact, but an alternative crowd. Um, but co incorporeal celestial beings also constitute a crowd in this story. As they await the return of the crow, in this story it's not a dove, Noah sent out, his family assumes the singing of the refrain. So the family's collective voice underscores the silence of the drowned, who did not cry out the refrain when they could, and now it is too late to cry out. As if to reinforce God's favor upon those who speak, Romanos mentions God's delight in recognizing his own image once again, so an allusion to uh, the creation of the first humans. The elect rescued from the ravages of the storm and are capable of crying out the refrain, redeem us all. So let us pause to consider, I've told you kind of the story, it's a story of different crowds getting to share in this refrain. So there's something ironic when you say, and they couldn't say, redeem us all, and then those who can say, redeem us all. But let's pause and think a little bit more about this performative setting. The, congr the congregation sings the words that the unrepentant refuse to utter, redeem us all. The congregation fills the void left by the silent and eventually silenced crowd. They join with Noah's lone voice, um, they join with Noah's lone voice and ironically sing counterfactually. By counterfactual, I mean simply that the damned could have spoken these words and saved themselves. Yet the chorus sustains the song, and that should come as no surprise. For the chorus stands for the children of the baptismal font. The word echoes the pool or where they underwent their baptism. And the hymn bears several echoes of their baptismal experience. There's the term for pool to connote the font. The ark is described in language reminiscent of death and rebirth imagery associated with baptism. So the ark is itself a womb and a tomb, all of which call to remind the congregations of its own baptisms. So Romanos performatively has constructed a drama which mobilizes the congregation to sing when the unrepentant fall silent, join the collective voice to the solitary exemplar, and speak with the saved. The congregation furnishes the voices of the lost, and the refrain here serves as the key to salvation, even if those who need it most are incapable of uttering it in the story. Um, I have focused on the refrain because I think that Noah, ref um, it, is, it is the tool by which to differentiate the saved from the dam in a hymn about divine judgment past and future. So to provide, one might say, a sonorous home for the elect. The refrain instills order, even as the voices of the damned gurgle down into the depths of the waters. In this way, Lent began with wholesale destruction and mass repentance as described by the silenced and the saved. And through these victories, and through these victories, um, sorry, uh, the, in, the refrain was instrumental for repairing the breach as congregations sang from both sides of the chasm. They affirmed as others denied, they spoke where others fell silent. Populating these stories allowed the hymnographer Ramanos to create an emotional echo chamber by which emotions could be voiced, echoed, and become contagious. Through repetition and singing, the congregation were engaged in what Cher calls, quote, emotional practices, mobilizing, naming, communicating, and regulating emotion, end quote. In other words, the congregation is not the sum of individuals, but constituted and even mobilized into an embodied crowd. Invented speech names the emotions, pity, fear, grief, and communicates their import about what's at stake. So emotion or affect, and this is a slide of the ascension. I just, even early Christians, this, this story about Jesus ascending to heaven. You know, he's actually, it's like he's climbing the Y, up to the Y, right? Uh, he said, you know, he's just, I'm, just, I'm so blown away by the mountains around here. But notice the fear of his disciples, 
the grief in the lower right of the women at the empty tomb and count. In the, this mix of emotions. When early Christians thought about the emotions, it was always a very mixed set of emotions. Are, is, is grief and fear an appropriate emotion for the ascension? Romanos has a song where he actually deals with this, that the psalms are psalms of joy that are being echoed as the disciples describe their fear. So I just want to use this as kind of a closing image for this talk. Emotion or affect, in the words of cultural critic Sarah Ahmed, quote, is what sticks or what sustains or preserves the connection between ideas, values, and objects. I have explored a few of those sticky places in early Christian practices that shape the formation of identity through affective and affecting storytelling. We've considered some of the tools of re-educating the senses, conjuring ancient worlds to counteract the newness of the Eucharist, invented speech to render figures and emotions from the biblical past more vivid and immediate, and the interjection of the refrain not just as a discursive artifact, the word spoken, but also in its ritual and repetitive forces acclamation. As Roman historian Gregory Aldrete has noted, acclamations took several forms. In addition to greetings, there were acclamations of praise, reactive acclamations, acclamations of criticism or petition. I would add that each type conveys different emotions of varying intensity. So to ancient Christians, stories were more than words. They were a range of emotions that infused the bodies that uttered them. Sadly, um, no, what is, what these baptismal and, and Noah sermons remind us is that the staying power of an embodied Christianity experienced by collective emotions through story, memory, community, with its villains, its hero, and even sadly, its scapegoats. Many religious communities in the past and today care and reproduce a text through performing, recounting, and reenacting that sacred past. Um, I've, I've actually, I live very close to Hill Cumorah, and that, that is a great example of a reenactment and staging of one's past around Founders' Day. Um, by paying closer attention to the performative and effective dimensions of this practice, I hope I've brought a distant, now fragmentary Mediterranean practice closer to fruitful comparison, but certainly not conflation with other religious communities in other parts of the globe and across time. Thank you very much. around. Um, redeem we had one person who has a class, so I'm just going to take that question first, and then, um, yeah. Can you say your question again? Yeah, so my question is, um, kind of, what is the historical context behind the early initiatory rites um, concerning anointing with oil to different parts of the body? Like, when did that start? What Christian sects did that develop into? Yeah. Kind of the history of that. It's, uh, all our evidence is a little sketchy, but what we can see.